Hi, I'm Richard Wong. I wrote a play called Caucasian that it will be presented as part of the Talking It Out Virtual Arts Festival this month. Um, I hope you all watch it and enjoy it. And if you'd like to learn more about it, stay tuned. We're going to talk about it. Well, I guess I first fell in love with theater when I was young. I'm not sure exactly when, probably high school, possibly earlier than that. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't realize it until much, much later in life. Um, I, when I was in high school, I was a, a pretty shy kid, um, not a lot of self-confidence. And uh, our theater department didn't put on a lot of plays. And um, the, the kids there, you know, they were theater kids. And uh, they kind of intimidated me, to be honest with you. And I, I really envied them that they could do something like that. And yet I never tried it. Uh, when I was in college, I, I went to a lot of the college uh, productions and just, again, really wished I could do that and be up there, but never had the confidence to, to actually try. Um, when I was in graduate school, I took uh, a lot of creative writing classes and a playwriting class. And, um, and I, I, I fell in love with the, the writing side of it because I just didn't feel that I could ever be a performer. And, but I, I did seem to have a, a knack for writing. Um, then, uh, unfortunately, when I finished graduate school, uh, I, uh, I was at a decision point in my life. I went to graduate school in upstate New York, and I thought how fun it would be to just go down to New York and be a bohemian and be a starving artist and, uh, and write plays and who knows where it goes. Uh, or I could do the sensible thing like my mom wanted me to do, go move back home. And so that's what I did. I got a job as a teacher and I kind of put all my creative uh, interests aside uh, for about 45 years, actually. And uh, I always had stories in my head. I always wanted to be a writer. Um, but, you know, life always got in the way. Uh, I got married. I had kids. We had kids. We got a new job. We got another new job. We moved. And um, so when I finally retired about two and a half years ago, I thought, well, you know, I've always wanted to be a writer. So this is the time. So that's kind of a long winded uh, way of, of explaining that. And unfortunately, uh, I, I'm a, an aspiring writer who kind of took a 45 year hiatus from actually writing. I think my interest in, in theater and in the creative arts in general probably was there all along. I, I think the, the moment that it really bit me was when I was a freshman um, and uh, my brother was, uh, was at the same university I was. He was two years ahead of me. And uh, we were just kind of exploring campus and we wandered on to the, into the theater and there was a free production that night that we didn't know about. I think the theater uh, department was just trying to showcase for new students what, uh, what was available. So we wandered in and it was to me just so illuminating that these were students. And I thought, wow, this is my new life. I'm no longer a high school kid. I'm a college kid. And uh, this is what college is all about, theater. But then, unfortunately, I didn't really do anything with it. But, um, you know, it was always in the back of my head. And, and I guess you could call it an obsession that kind of grew and grew with each year. I never lost interest in it. I, I was just always interested in theater and always wanted to be a part of it. Uh, I um living relatively close to New York for a lot of our adult life. My wife and I um, went to uh, New York quite a bit, and uh, we lived in the D.C. area for a while, and a long while, actually 35 years. And most people don't know that Washington, D.C. has the second most live theater in America, next only to New York. So we felt very fortunate that we... We had a lot of theater in um, in our area, and we went to it. We I just never thought that I could actually be a part of it as, as a creator, as uh, someone on that side of it. I was always in the audience. Um, so 
So it, it was always there and it kind of grew. And I, I think I realized it very gradually. And I'm not sure exactly when it was, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I realized, you know, I really want to be part of that. <laughs> and uh, and then I started having thoughts of, uh, well, what would have happened if I hadn't made the sensible decision 45 years ago and I had gone to New York, you know? Could I have been the per- first Chinese playwright on Broadway before uh, Henry David Huang? You know, I-, I always felt like, yeah, that could have been me. <laughs> My creative process, uh, really, I, I'm still, uh, it's still germinating and I'm still developing it. Um, I'm, I'm in my late 60s and I'm an aspiring playwright. So I don't know that I've actually found my rhythm and my process yet. Uh, but the way that I, I create now is that uh, stories just come into my head and, and I, I see stories in everyday life, just in pretty much everything I do. I, I can't avoid them. I get these stories and then ideas just turn in my head until um, until they spill out and I, I have no choice but to write them down. And then um, I was a, a an editor for a number of years. So I really like taking something uh, and and just playing with it and, and uh, continually uh, looking at it from different angles until I get something, a product that I, uh, I think is, is what I would be happy with. Well, when I was in college, um, and I, I think I'm going to get these names wrong, but uh, I had a professor who, uh, who told us, I think it was Dryden and Pope. And uh, he said that Dryden uh, was a very meticulous writer and he, he would write something and have to go over it uh, dozens of times and rewrite and tweak it and uh, and just keep playing with it until he felt it was perfect. And Alexander Pope would hit an idea, he'd write it down, and he'd be done with it. That was it. And I always thought, yeah, I wish I could do that. I just can't. <laughs> I get an idea, and I I just have to keep playing with it, and I keep have to tweak, keep tweaking it. Um, I once heard someone say that artists never finish a work, they're just forced to relinquish it, and that's how I feel. I first heard about uh, the Talking It Out uh, Festival about a year and a half, maybe two years ago. Um, at that point, I had written a the first draft, or maybe the first five drafts of my play, uh, Caucasian, and it dealt with uh, LGBTQ issues, which uh, I know the Talking It Out F- Festival uh, is very interested in, a- as well as uh, racial issues. And um, I just thought, well, this is a this is a venue that that could would really understand my play and, and would make the best of it. Uh, the play deals with the five stages of grief, and I had submitted it somewhere else, and I don't think they understood the five stages of grief. And so I thought, well, if anyone would understand that, it would be a an arts festival dedicated to mental health. So I was very happy that it was chosen. I wrote Caucasian uh, because it, it's an idea that had been germinating in my head uh, for a really long time. It's ostensibly about Asian issues, but it's really as much about LGBTQIA issues and the way that people look at people who are different from themselves. And at its heart, the play is really about the the last stage of grief, which is acceptance. Uh, acceptance of ourselves, acceptance of people that we see as different from ourselves. And, um, and I hope... Uh, what people take away from it is that by understanding and accepting, we realize that we're not really that different from each other. Uh, we may be f- from different cultures. We we may um, be of different genders and different sexual orientations, but we're really, we're all humans. And, and because of that, we have a lot of similarities that very often we don't see and we don't realize. Um, 
what I'd like this play to, to ultimately do for people is to help them understand and, and perhaps observe uh, things that they, they've they never realized and observed before. The the term, the title came to me, and, and I'm, I know that the muse just struck me because I'm not sure I could have come up with it on my own. But I, I was trying to think of a title for the play that would reflect the idea that Asians and Caucasians are really not that dissimilar. We have a lot more similarities. And if we understood each other's cultures, uh, I think we could understand each other better and, and accept each other. And we wouldn't have any of the conflicts that we've had. And um, at the time there had been, uh, it was during the, the COVID crisis and uh, there was a lot of Asian hate going on at the same time. And sadly it's still going on. But I just thought, well, if people would just understand that we're really not that different, we're not the enemy, we're all in this together. And it, it just came to me that the word Asian is embedded in the word Caucasian. And I never realized that. I mean, I had been using those two words my whole life, and I thought, well, gosh, <laughs> those two words are basically the same. I mean, they're half the letters are the same letters. And, and that's the type of realization I hope people will get as they watch um, this play, that, yeah, we have a lot of similarities and a lot of things that they that people have said perhaps their whole lives, really uh, it, it shows our similarities more than our differences. The plot is essentially a father and a son uh, having a conversation. And that's, uh, in, in 20 minutes, that's the entire plot. Um, and uh, the, the son uh, discloses a realization to his father and it sends his father uh, through the five stages of grief. Um, I, I like to think it's funny. I, I, I have an odd sense of humor. My kids and, and, uh, those, those of us who are dads know kids never think their dad's jokes are funny. I think the play is pretty funny. Um, and I, I would like to, I know it, it's, it's a, um, the, the issues are very serious that it deals with, uh, racism, uh, Asian, uh, hate, um, prejudice against the LGBTQIA community. Uh, so those are pretty heavy topics, but I, I want to deal with them in a, a somewhat lighthearted way to, to showcase that, you know, all the prejudice, the bias, it's pretty absurd. And, and in a lot of ways, the play is, is kind of an absurd play. Um, but I wanted to, to use the absurdity and the silliness to show that hey, all of this is pretty silly. I mean, why are we in conflict with each other? It's just silly. When people watch the play, I would like them to see that people who are different from themselves really aren't that different. Uh, people of other cultures, people of other sexual orientations, uh, people who are of color, we're all basically the same. We're humans. And uh the, the things that people see that make us different really showcase how similar we are. And uh, there are, I, I've thrown in a lot of, uh, I, I would think, pretty insensitive comments that people have said to me through my life. And, and I don't think they're bad people for saying it. I think very often people say things that they don't realize are insensitive because they don't understand the other culture. And I hope that by showcasing some of these, these comments in a humorous way, uh, people will see that, oh, well, yes, that was kind of insensitive and maybe irrational to say that. And maybe we shouldn't be saying things like that to people anymore. <laughs> I think when people see my play, I hope they will say, hey, I never thought of it like that before. Or, wow, that, that's an interesting way to look at it. I've never looked at it quite in that way. Uh, I hope there will be a lot of aha moments. And I, I hope those aha moments involve not just 
uh, the Asian community, but the LGBTQIA community and and, and community. Uh, I I hope that it it just uh, encourages people to to take the concepts that I present in the play and maybe broaden them to the larger scope of, of their life and and be able to apply it to uh, to other areas uh, because it, it's it's not just a play about uh, about the Asian community or the LGBTQIA community. I, I think it's a a much broader uh, play about under, human understanding and, and understanding ourselves in ways that maybe we hadn't quite understood before. I would like every person in in the country to be a, aware and familiar with the Talking It Out uh, Virtual Arts Festival because. It's just such an important uh, uh, event uh, throughout the year. Uh, I think it's, it's a very uh, necessary event right now. There has been a lot of attention given to uh, mental health these days. Um, and unfortunately, uh, most of it, I think, isn't, isn't really discussing mental health as much as mental illness. Because... The, the talk always escalates after there's a tragedy, like there's a shooting or, or someone suffers from PSTD or, or some other disorder and, and some tragedy happens. Well, I'd like to think that uh, mental health is, is on the other side of that. If, if we pay more attention to mental health, maybe we can avoid mental illness and, and we can avoid the tragedies that arise from mental illness. Um, I was on the peripheries of, of the counseling world for over 20 years. And, and so I have a, a, a little deeper understanding of uh, an awareness and appreciation perhaps uh, of mental health and mental wellness. I have a degree in counseling, uh, school counseling. And, uh, and I just think that I wish we would all take care of our mental wellness like we do our physical wellness. Most of us go to see a doctor at least once a year, sometimes every six months. We get a checkup. We're not sick, but we want to make sure we don't get sick uh, physically. And I wish we could apply that to our uh, mental health as well. Maybe if we did that, we could catch depression with a little d before it turns into clinical depression with a big d. Uh, if we can catch anxiety and and a host of other disorders and deal with them, then then I think the the world would be not only a happier safe place but a safer place that people wouldn't uh, wouldn't let mental illness and and disorders get to the point that um, that it it ends in tragedy. And the talking it out virtual arts festival addresses that, but not in a direct clinical way, but in, in a a more entertaining way. I think if we had more uh, entertainment venues and uh, activities that would address mental health, um, and not in in a way that beats you over the head that says if you have a problem, go see a, a therapist, but in a way that that provokes some thought and and encourages people to think about it. Uh, that I hope my play does. Well, I think it's really important for people to to support activities like the Talking It Out Virtual Arts Festival, as well as other uh, theater, community theater perhaps, uh, any artistic uh, efforts uh, in their community that they they can be involved in. You know, we all know the, the superstars. We know Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt, Julia Roberts, and uh, people like that. What a lot of people don't realize is that there are thousands, perhaps millions of people who are making a, a living as actors. They're never going to be household names, but they make decent livings being actors. And there are, are scores of others who have a, an interest in it, a burning desire that perhaps they don't want it to make it their profession, but it, it's still a passion for them. And I think those people need to be uh, supported and um, 
if we can do it in any way possible from just going to a local community theater and buying a ticket or making donations to a local theater. Um, for this performance in particular, uh, I'm really grateful that the Talking It Out Virtual Arts Festival is uh, contributing part of the proceeds to the National Asian American uh, Pacific Islander Mental Health Association. Um, being someone who has a background in, in mental health and being an Asian, I think that organization is very is is close to me, and I, I support what they do. And as someone who grew up in America as an Asian uh, from the Asian culture, I know how uh, difficult it is for Asians, in particular. Uh, to accept the idea of mental health and mental wellness and and help when someone has a disorder. Uh, not only am I from a different culture, I think I'm from a different age. I'm uh, it, When I was a child, particularly uh, as an immigrant, uh, Asians just didn't talk about mental illness. And if someone had a, a, a disorder, it, it was a real source of ignominy. People were very ashamed of it and would not uh, be willing to talk about it. So I think organizations like the, the National Asian American Pacific Islander Mental Health Association are doing a lot of really good work to bring, uh, to bring those, uh, those issues to the forefront and, and, work toward eliminating the stigmas, which are still very great right now. And um, the Talking It Out Virtual Arts Festival is doing the same thing on a broader scale, uh, using entertainment and art to perhaps uh, address a lot of the stigmas and a lot of the, um, the, the ways that people do not uh, look at uh, mental health and that they should. I, I hope a lot of people uh, We'll watch the, the plays. Um, the cast and crew have put a lot of work into it. Uh, I've I've only been to a one uh, rehearsal, but I know I, I, I've never been involved in in uh, theater at this level. And just from what little I've done thus far, I'm realizing there's a lot of work that goes into it. And <laughs> I, I always thought, well, maybe I would like to be an actor. I'm not sure I could put that much work into it. So they put a lot of work into it. A lot of people have have put a lot of effort into it. And and so I hope people will watch it and and will enjoy it and will um will appreciate all the work that has gone into this. I'm Richard Wong. Uh I hope that everyone will attend the Talking It Out Virtual Arts Festival and enjoy my play, Caucasian. Uh, if you come, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you'll come with an open mind and uh, leave just a little more enlightened than you came in.